I want to read to you from Psalm 107, and we're just going to start out by reading the first three verses, but then I want to encourage you, if you're a Bible flipper in, you know, a paper book, or if you've got it on your phone, we're going to have hopefully some verses up here, although I think I'm going to give Graham a challenge this morning to keep up with the verses that um, we're looking at in Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Lord, help us to give thanks to you this morning because you're worthy. Lord, write these scriptures, these truths, not just on our minds, but on our hearts and on our lives. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. So, this week is Thanksgiving, and, you know, whatever we do in our lives, we want to do it right, right? I mean, we don't want to do it wrong, and that's why we're talking about how to Christmas, but this morning, maybe you think of this message as how to Thanksgiving, because you can do it wrong, right? Right? In fact, I've always been struck by the fact that there are people in our society that would say, we should be grateful, but I don't believe in God, they say. I'm like, so who are you grateful to? You ever wonder that? And Scripture says over and over and over again that we're supposed to be grateful to God. In fact, if you look back at the history of Thanksgiving, that was really clear. In 1777, the Continental Congress, in November of that year, had a national proclamation of Thanksgiving. They said, we are thankful to Almighty God for what he has done. In 1789... George Washington said, it's interesting, he kind of blamed it on Congress. He said, Congress has told me that I should do this. <laughs> um, but he recommended to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. So, 1777... The Continental Congress says, be thankful. 1789, George Washington says, be thankful. Several individual presidents proclaimed that same thing over the next few years. Interestingly, Thomas Jefferson said, you can be thankful if you want. That's between you and your God. So... I, I don't know what to do with that. But then in, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you're a history buff, notice this. 1863, was the war over? No. 1865, the war ended. But Abraham Lincoln, while the war was still going on, proclaimed that we as a nation should be trusting the sovereign hand of God even when everything wasn't okay. I think that's important. And as we look at the psalm this morning, we'll see this. 
But the point of this is not, oh, look what a great nation we are. The point of this is that every one of those things was a statement that said, there must be someone to be grateful to. If you're taking notes on the sheet here, um, it says that gratitude must, thanksgiving must have an object. You must be thankful to someone or something to say, I'm just kind of grateful to the universe in a lot of ways doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. So what does the Bible say? I mean, ultimately, I mean, I'm a George Washington fan, but, you know, he didn't speak for God. Psalm 107 says this. It says, give thanks. Stop there. Give thanks. It's interesting, as I studied this this week, I learned like a lot of us growing up that really what we need is an attitude of gratitude, right? You ever heard that before? That's not what this says. When it says give thanks, give is a public expression. Give thanks means a public expression. It means we express to those around us out loud that we are grateful. And so if I just walk around with a grateful heart without ever saying thank you, I'm not really doing what this scripture says. In fact, one of the things that especially men say to justify our, the fact that we are often really bad at giving gifts is we say, it's the thought that counts. Is that really true? Gentlemen, if you're married, if you were to say, hey, honey, it's our anniversary, but I didn't get you anything or I didn't do anything, but I I thought about you. How's that going to go? I mean, after all, it's the thought, maybe not. So give thanks means a public outward expression of gratitude. Why are we supposed to do that? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Now, that's interesting. He doesn't say that he does good things. It says that is the nature of who God is. He's good. In fact, it's a fascinating word in the Hebrew. Um, it, the word is tov. Everybody say tov. It, it doesn't just mean good things. It means deep moral goodness. God doesn't just choose to do good. God is by the nature of who he is, he's good. In fact, you can translate this and by saying God isn't just good. God is goodness itself. That's why Job can say, though he slay me, I will yet hope in him. Because God is good. We're supposed to give thanks because God is good. There's another reason. And his love endures forever. Now we've talked about this word. I, I, I'm making two Hebrew references this week to impress you by my va- vast knowledge of Hebrew, which includes about two words. <laughs> but tov is God is good, and this word for love is hesed, and we've talked about that before. Everybody say hesed. Okay, that means more than love. It means kindness. It means there's really no equivalent word in English. It means mercy and kindness and love and loyalty and faithfulness and grace and compassion. It is a statement of the fact that God's outpouring of grace and love and everything that we need on a spiritual level is 
constant and deep. And in fact, it doesn't just mean hesed as in God is good to us. It, it me, it's a covenantal word, I guess, is what I would say. It means we belong to each other. It means that we swim in God's hesed. We exist in, in it. We live and move and have our being. That is the life that we live in, even if we don't recognize it. You might have heard people talk about before the idea that, you know, are fish aware of the water? We don't know. I've never asked a fish, but sometimes when you are surrounded by something, you don't even recognize that it's there. So it's saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Now we could stop right there. We should give thanks just because God is good and just because he chooses to love. But the scripture doesn't start right there. It doesn't stop right there. Look at verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Now, you might have grown up with the idea that let the redeemed of the Lord say so, right? Right? That's been written in a couple songs. That's a familiar wording. But even think about that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What is that so? Let the redeemed of the Lord say that they are the redeemed of the Lord, right? It's talking about the fact that those of us who have been rescued by God should express that. The thanksgiving that the Bible calls us to is almost always verbal. It's to be sung. It's to be spoken. It's to be proclaimed. It's supposed to be out loud. Psalm 95 says, let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. You can't do that silently, can you? Extol him with music and song silently. That didn't work. We already read together Psalm 100, which says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. It's a verbal thing. Now wait, so we're supposed to be do that. Who is supposed to do that? The redeemed. Those of us who have been purchased by God. And that's a significant meaning when this was written in a way that maybe we don't understand. There was a, an understanding of redemption that we knew that people would live their lives in such a way that sometimes they would end up in debt so deep or they would that they would end up in prison or they would end up literally as slaves because they couldn't pay off their own debt and when it says redeemed it means God has paid your debt. God has, has taken us when we have on a certain level lost everything. He has paid our debt. He has bought us out of slavery. That's what God did in Jesus Christ. And the rest of Psalm 107 kind of gives us instructions on how to do that how to give thanks and it lists um, four things that four ways in which God has redeemed us 
First of all, uh, we see that God retrieves us when we wander. Then secondly, we see that God releases us when we're captives. Then we see that God restores us when we're sick. And finally, God rescues us in the storm. See, for our words, are, are we impressed by that? And that? I was pretty proud of that. <clears throat> so what does it do? And I want you to be thinking about this because we want to give you a chance in about five minutes to thank God for how God has worked in your life. First of all, it says that God retrieves us when we wander. That those times, and you see this in verses 4 through 9, it talks about some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. And then God, then look at verse 6. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. That phrase happens four times. In all of these situations in Psalm 107, the psalmist says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. So that's part of the key, is crying out to the Lord in our trouble. And I, I thought about, I don't know if I've told this story before, but... On our honeymoon, Julie and I got married in October of 1989. We rode our dinosaur out to Colorado, and we rented a cabin, and October in Colorado is kind of right on the break into winter. And we went for a hike in the mountains, and, you know, we could look off in the mountains and you can see a storm coming. We knew that there maybe might be snow, but I, I thought, because I'm an expert growing up in Iowa, I'm an expert on mountains, I said, oh, we'll be fine. We just, you know, we'll be, it's a long way away. And we were probably about a mile away from our car, and it started to snow. And one of the crazy things about snow in the mountains is that it can become quickly hard to see the path. And we quickly, within a few minutes, began to realize we were not sure where the path was. And even though we were probably less than a mile from our car, we began to worry that we might not find our way back to where we needed to find our way back to. And there was that moment when we said, oh, there's the car. We went from lost to found, and that's what God says in this psalm. God says, I retrieved you when you were lost. I retrieved you when you wandered. And I want, we're going to give you a chance in a minute to ask ourselves, how has God retrieved us in our wandering? Then it says, he released us when we were captives. And there's pictures of chains and darkness and rebellion and being far from God and being unable to, to break free of that. Now, sometimes that is not easy, is it? Sometimes it's not even pleasant. When I was growing up, and you, I had a cold, especially in church, because they didn't want me coughing when my dad was preaching. If I had a cough, there were, you remember Luden's cough drops? the cherry candy that really wasn't 
medicine, but it, it tasted good. They, they still have that. But on the other hand, there were these gray, chalky throat discs, lozenges that were awful. But they worked. What did I want? Ludens. What did I need? The gray, chalky, I don't know what that's called, but it's evil. Anyway, God rescues us when we are captives. He frees us. He releases us. And again, it says, they called, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And in both of these, it says this, look at verse 8, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. In our gratitude, we're supposed to cry out to the Lord and then we're supposed to give thanks for what he has done. Two more things. It says he restores us when we're sick. And it paints in verses 17 through 22. I encourage you, go back and read this. It says they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And then it says give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. So in the middle of sickness, God rescues us. And finally, in verses 23 through 32, it talks about him rescuing us in the storm. Now, we don't necessarily relate to literal storms now in our lives. Even if you've been on a cruise the chances are you were on a cruise ship so big that even a major storm barely made it rock a little bit. But in those days, they would be on the Mediterranean and there would be storms and they understood that if they cried to the Lord in their trouble, not just physical, literal storms, but in the midst of life, if we cry out to the Lord in our trouble, he will hear us. And then it says, let us give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. So I want to ask you, as you think back on your life, or even just on this year, how has God retrieved you when you wander? Or retrieved somebody else, somebody you love when they wandered? How has God freed you released you when you were captive. Maybe it was just stress and fear and, well, I shouldn't say just stress and fear. That can be awful. Maybe you experienced that sense of casting your anxiety on the Lord because he cared for you and you felt freedom. You ever had that sense when a burden was weighing you down and God set you free. Is there a time when you've been sick and God has been with you in that and has rescued you from it? And finally, has there been a storm that God brought you through? 